Welcome to History Uncovered, where we delve into the stories and events that have shaped our world. If you're a fan of history, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. We release new videos every day so you'll always have something new to discover. By subscribing, you'll be the first to know when our latest episodes are released, and you'll be supporting us in our mission to bring fascinating stories from the past to a wider audience. In this episode, we're journeying back to the tumultuous times of the 5th century, to the vast and windswept steppes of Central Asia, where a figure of legendary ferocity and power rose to prominence. A man whose name would echo through the annals of history, instilling fear in the hearts of the mighty Roman Empire, and leaving an indelible mark on the world. This man was none other than Attila the Hun. Attila, often referred to as the Scourge of God, was the ruler of the Huns, a nomadic people who originated from the steppes of Central Asia. Under his leadership, the Huns became a dominant force, terrorizing both halves of the Roman Empire and creating a legacy that would be remembered for centuries to come. In this episode, we will unravel the life of this formidable leader, explore the rise of the Hunnic Empire under his rule, and delve into the battles, strategies, and events that defined his reign. We'll also seek to separate the man from the myth, shedding light on the enigmatic figure that was Attila the Hun. So, buckle up as we embark on this journey back in time, to the era of Attila, the fearsome king of the Huns, a man whose story is as captivating as it is terrifying. Welcome to the world of Attila the Hun, on History Uncovered. Emerging from the vast expanses east of the Volga, the Huns, a group of Eurasian nomads, embarked on a westward migration around 370 AD. These formidable warriors, adept in mounted archery and javelin throwing, began to establish settlements even before they reached Western Europe. Primarily pastoral warriors, their diet predominantly consisted of meat and milk, products of their extensive herds. The Huns' origins and language have long been subjects of scholarly debate. Some theories suggest that their leadership might have spoken a Turkic language, possibly akin to the modern Chuvash language. The Encyclopedia of European Peoples posits that the Huns, especially those migrating westward, might have been an amalgamation of Central Asian Turkic, Mongolic, and Ugric groups. Attila's lineage traces back to Munzuk, his father, who was the sibling of the Hunnic Empire's joint rulers, Akhtar and Ruga, in the early 5th century. This dual leadership system was not uncommon among the Huns, though it remains unclear whether this was a formal institution, a mere tradition, or an occasional arrangement. While Attila hailed from noble descent, it's uncertain if his family represented a royal dynasty. His birth date remains a topic of contention among historians, with estimates ranging from 395 to the early 5th century. Attila's formative years were set against a backdrop of significant upheaval. The Huns, originally nomads, had recently made their way into Europe. By the 370s, they had crossed the Volga River, subjugating the Alans and challenging the Gothic kingdom situated between the Carpathian Mountains and the Danube. Their mobility and formidable mounted archers earned them an aura of invincibility, with the Germanic tribes seemingly powerless against them. The Huns' onslaught prompted vast migrations, with many seeking refuge within the Roman Empire's borders. Notably, in 376 AD, the Goths crossed the Danube, initially allying with the Romans but soon rebelling, culminating in their victory at the Battle of Adrianople in 378 AD. The Huns' pressure also led to the mass movement of Vandals, Alans, Swabi, and Burgundians into Roman Gaul in 406 AD. The Roman Empire itself was undergoing transformation. Since 395 AD, it had been bifurcated, governed by two distinct entities, the Western Roman Empire, headquartered in Ravenna, and the Eastern Roman Empire, based in Constantinople. The Theodosian dynasty predominantly held the imperial throne during Attila's lifetime, despite intermittent power struggles. The Huns' dominion was vast and complex, with its borders defined more by the diverse peoples under its sway than by geographical landmarks. While some groups assimilated into the Hunnic fold, others retained their distinct identities, albeit under the Huns' overarching suzerainty. Interestingly, while the Huns indirectly exacerbated many challenges for the Romans by pushing various tribes into Roman territories, the two empires maintained a relatively cordial relationship. 
The Romans often employed the Huns as mercenaries, and there were instances of alliances, such as between 401 and 450 AD, which facilitated numerous Roman military triumphs. However, perceptions differed. The Huns viewed Roman payments as tribute, while the Romans saw it as compensation for services. By the time Attila came of age under his uncle Ruga's reign, the Huns had ascended to such prominence that Nestorius, the patriarch of Constantinople, lamented, they have become both masters and slaves of the Romans. The death of Rugula in 434 marked a pivotal moment for the Hunnic Empire. Leadership now fell to Attila and his brother Blida, the sons of Munzuk. As they ascended to power, the Hun tribes were in negotiations with the Eastern Roman Empire, led by Emperor Theodosius II, over the return of several renegades who had sought refuge in the Roman territories. In 435, a significant meeting took place. Attila and Blida, along with the Roman envoys, convened at Margus, all seated on horseback in traditional Hunnic fashion. The outcome was a treaty favorable to the Huns. The Romans committed to returning the fugitives, doubling their tribute to the Huns, opening their markets to Hun traders, and paying a ransom for each Roman prisoner. With the treaty in place, the Huns retreated to the Great Hungarian Plain, possibly to fortify their empire. Theodosius II seized this moment of respite to bolster Constantinople's defenses and fortify the Danube's borders. However, the Huns' ambitions were not limited to Europe. They turned their attention to the Sassanid Empire, although their efforts were thwarted in Armenia. By 440, the Huns were back, targeting Roman merchants along the Danube. Their campaign was ruthless. Cities like Viminatium and Illyricum were devastated. Their demands were clear, hand over a bishop who had retained what Attila considered his property. As the Romans deliberated, the bishop betrayed them, aligning with the Huns. Simultaneously, the Vandals, under Geyseric, captured the western Roman province of Africa, depriving Rome of its wealthiest province and primary food source. The eastern Roman Empire was further strained when the Sassanid Shah Yazdegerd II invaded Armenia in 441. The Romans, hoping to reclaim Africa, redirected their forces from the Balkans to Sicily. This strategic move left Attila and Blida an open path to invade the Balkans in 441, leading to the sacking of cities like Margus, Viminatium, Singidunum, and Sirmium. Theodosius II, confident in his military prowess, defied the Hun kings. Attila retaliated in 443 with a formidable campaign. For the first time, the Huns wielded battering rams and siege towers, enabling them to conquer cities like Rashiara and Nisus. Their path of destruction led them to the gates of Constantinople, where they were halted by the city's formidable walls. However, they managed to defeat another Roman army near Callipolis. Theodosius II, recognizing the might of the Huns, sought peace. The new terms imposed by the Huns were even more stringent. The Romans were to pay a hefty fine, triple their annual tribute, and increase the ransom for Roman prisoners. With their demands met, the Huns retreated, and Blida's death soon followed, leaving Attila as the sole ruler of the Hunnic Empire. In the mid-5th century, the tides of power and diplomacy were in constant flux. Attila, the formidable Hunnish king, had set his sights on the Visigoth kingdom of Toulouse, seeking an alliance with Emperor Valentinian III of the Western Roman Empire. This was a surprising move, given Attila's previously amicable relations with the West and its influential general, Flavius Aetius. Aetius had even spent time in exile among the Huns and had collaborated with Attila against common enemies, earning him significant recognition in the Roman military hierarchy. Yet, a twist in the tail came in the form of Anaria, Valentinian's sister. Desperate to escape a forced betrothal, she sent Attila a plea for help, accompanied by her engagement ring. Whether or not she intended this as a marriage proposal, Attila interpreted it as such, demanding half of the Western Roman Empire as her dowry. This audacious claim sent shockwaves through the Roman court. Valentinian, initially contemplating fratricide, chose exile for his sister under his mother Galla Placidia's counsel. He vehemently denied any legitimacy to Attila's marriage claim. Undeterred, Attila asserted his right to marry Anuria and stake his claim on the Western Empire. 
Simultaneously, Attila became embroiled in a Frankish succession dispute, siding with the elder son against Aetius' favored younger claimant. Rallying his vast array of vassals, from Jepids to Ostrogoths to Alans, Attila marched westward. By 451, he had reached Belgica, with his forces, though likely exaggerated in number, posing a significant threat. He captured Metz and terrorized other cities, with only the divine interventions of saints, as per hagiographies, saving some from his wrath. Recognizing the imminent threat, Aetius rallied forces, drawing from the Franks, Burgundians, and Celts. Crucially, he secured an alliance with the Visigoth king, Theodoric I. This combined force managed to reach Orleans before Attila, halting the Hunnish advance. The two mighty armies eventually clashed near Catalanum in what is known as the Battle of the Catalanian Plains. The battle, fierce and bloody, saw the death of Theodoric but ended in what many consider a strategic victory for the Roman Visigothic alliance. Attila was forced into retreat. However, Aetius, in a display of political acumen, chose not to pursue a decisive victory. He recognized the delicate balance of power, an overwhelming Visigothic win might be as problematic as a defeat. Thus, the battle concluded with Attila's ambitions checked, the Visigoths losing their king, and the Romans appearing as the triumphant defenders of the West. The savage tyrant Attila, after causing the death of countless multitudes and laying waste with dreadful slaughter the northern parts of Italy, was turned from his course at the Periver. Thus, by God's will, he was cast down and withdrew beyond the Danube, having failed to accomplish any of his objectives in Italy. He returned to his homeland, leaving Italy devastated but not enslaved. The invasion of Attila is a testament to the resilience of the Roman spirit and the strategic acumen of its leaders. While Attila's forces wreaked havoc, a combination of natural calamities, logistical challenges, and diplomatic interventions ensured that the heart of the Roman Empire remained untouched. The emergence of communities in the Venetian lagoon, which would later give rise to the city of Venice, is a poignant reminder of the lasting impact of these invasions. The Bishop of Rome, Leo I, played a pivotal role in the diplomatic efforts, and his meeting with Attila has since become legendary. While the exact details of their conversation remain a mystery, the outcome is well documented. Attila chose to retreat, leaving Italy in ruins, but its spirit unbroken. The challenges Attila faced were not just limited to Italy. Back in his homeland, another threat emerged. An East Roman force had ventured across the Danube, challenging the Huns who were safeguarding Attila's territories. This military pressure, combined with the challenges in Italy, compelled Attila to reconsider his ambitions. In the end, while Attila's name would go down in history as one of the most formidable adversaries the Roman Empire ever faced, his Italian campaign serves as a testament to the fact that even the mightiest can be challenged by unforeseen circumstances, strategic diplomacy, and the indomitable spirit of a people united in defense of their homeland. The death of Attila the Hun, one of history's most formidable warlords, came not in battle but, according to traditional accounts, during a night of celebration. After withdrawing from Italy and setting his sights on Constantinople, Attila's life took a sudden and unexpected turn. Emperor Marcian of the Eastern Roman Empire, showing a newfound boldness, had stopped the tribute to the Huns, a move that would have undoubtedly irked Attila. But before he could act on his plans to retaliate, fate intervened. On the night in question, Attila was celebrating his marriage to Ildico, a young woman whose name hints at Gothic or Ostrogoth heritage. As the festivities reached their peak, tragedy struck. Attila, in the midst of the revelry, began to bleed profusely. The exact cause of his death remains a topic of debate among historians. Some suggest he choked on his own blood due to a nosebleed, while others speculate that he suffered from internal bleeding, possibly from ruptured esophageal varices. Esophageal varices, often linked to chronic alcohol consumption, are enlarged veins in the lower part of the esophagus. They are prone to rupture, which can lead to a rapid and fatal hemorrhage. If Attila had indulged in excessive drinking over the years, this could have been a contributing factor. Regardless of the exact cause, the sudden death of such a feared and powerful leader would have sent shockwaves throughout the known world. Attila, 
who had terrorized empires and reshaped the political landscape of Europe, met an end that was both unexpected and humbling. It serves as a poignant reminder of the unpredictability of life and the inevitable mortality that all, even the mightiest, must face. The death of Attila the Hun marked the beginning of the end for the Hunnic Empire. His sons, Elek, Dengizik, and Ernak, eager to seize power, ended up fragmenting the empire they had inherited. They demanded that the nations under their father's rule be divided equally among them, treating the warlike kings and their peoples as if they were assets in a family estate. This treatment did not sit well with the Germanic alliance, led by the Jepid ruler Arderic, who had been a loyal ally to Attila. In response, they revolted against the Huns, culminating in the Battle of Nideo in 454 AD. In this battle, Attila's eldest son, Elek, was killed. The remaining sons continued their aggressive campaigns, viewing the Goths as deserters and treating them as fugitive slaves. However, their attempts to regain control were unsuccessful. Some groups of Huns, likely those under Ernak, moved to Scythia. Dengizik, another of Attila's sons, attempted an invasion across the Danube in 468 AD but was defeated at the Battle of Bashiani by the Ostrogoths. Dengizik was killed the following year, marking the end of the Hunnic dominion. Despite the numerous records of Attila's children and relatives, tracing a valid line of descent has proven challenging. Many genealogists have attempted to link various medieval rulers to Attila with varying degrees of credibility. The Nominalia of the Bulgarian Khans, for instance, claims a lineage from Attila through the mythological figures of Itahal and Ernik of the Dulo clan of the Bulgars. The Hungarian Arpid dynasty also claimed descent from Attila. Several medieval Hungarian chronicles, including the Gesta Hungarorum, Gesta Honorum et Hungarorum, Chronicon Pictum, Buddha Chronicle, and Chronica Hungarorum, assert that both the Arpid dynasty and the ABA clan are descendants of Attila. However, these claims remain a subject of historical debate and speculation. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the tumultuous era of Attila the Hun and the subsequent fall of the Hunnic Empire. The pages of history are filled with tales of power, ambition, and the intricate dance of diplomacy and warfare. We hope this episode has shed light on one of history's most enigmatic figures and the legacy he left behind. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. Until next time, keep uncovering the stories that have shaped our world.